Throughout my practice, I've been fascinated with the Western genre. Cowboys Invaded was a chance to combine it with another favourite of mine, science fiction. After watching Cowboys and Aliens, I was reminded how flexible both genres are, and when they are combined, be that a Western with sci-fi elements or vice versa. If we strip back the Western to its classical roots, we have a genre that Philip French believes reflects current feelings about shortcomings and blindness of our over mechanised, polluted, unbalanced, degenerating environment. The Western is a reflexive genre that uses American past to express how it feels today. Evolving from the writings of historian Frederick Jackson Turner and Theodore Roosevelt, combined with the early dime novels by authors such as Fenimore Cooper, a collective cultural movement was born mythologising the birth of a nation that is constantly being reinvented to reflect the political landscape of the day. Science fiction is just as flexible a genre that for the last 200 years has caused us to reflect our current state. It's more wide-reaching than one country, focusing on the power of science, from the power to play God in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, to Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? that looks to a post-apocalyptic future where artificial intelligence is so sophisticated they become sentient life themselves, bringing us full circle back to Frankenstein itself. Cinematically, both genres have varied periods of success. The Western, enjoying a golden age in the late 1930s through to the mid-1960s with images from Vietnam that destroyed the Hollywood illusion of violence for a more shocking reality. Science fiction had long been a fixture of low-budget B-movies to the anti-communist B-movies of the 1950s, such as Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Them. Very few A-movies were made during that time, such as Forbidden Planet and The Day the Earth Stood Still. However, it was during the American New Wave in the early 70s that the genre was allowed to properly blossom into what we have today. There was a turning point in the 1960s with President JFK's ambition to reach the moon. In his Rice Stadium speech of 1962, his carefully crafted speech touched on the America's history of taming of the West. Now looking ahead to the next frontier as outlined in his inaugural address of a future out in space, Seeing America as an outward-looking nation, focusing on getting a man to the moon, the first step before his dream of getting to Venus and beyond. The speech inspired America to consider the possibilities of that future as an opportunity, a sign of strength to the world, especially the Soviet Union, who weren't even mentioned. It was 18 minutes of inspirational dreaming for a better world, leaving the firm foundations laid down by the settlers of, of the still young country only a few hundred years ago. For the eyes of the world now look into space, to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. As the country looked ever more forward, film also did more so with technical wonders such as The Time Machine and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Tonally, cinema was getting more serious with the questions it was asking. Part of that development can be seen in the films I'm going to explore that combine both the Western and science fiction elements, showing how flexible the genre really is. Starting in the 1970s with Michael Crichton's directorial debut, this highly influential type thriller, Westworld, two men looking to escape their reality are able to kill and sleep with anyone they so desire in a Wild West themed park, populated with androids that are there to service their every whim and impulse. According to John Moore, 
These humans are creatures that pay exorbitant fees to escape from reality into a more primitive, less comfortable past. The fact alone says something about it, doesn't it? Specifically, it says that we've built ourselves an uncomfortable modern world in which the only outlet is a fantasy that looks to the past, less complicated times. Android hosts are essentially slaves built to please the amoral guests who care nothing for the cumulative effect on the androids or hosts continually being raped or killed. This seemingly innocent indulgence soon backfires when Yul Brynner's gunfighter straight out of the Magnificent Seven malfunctions along with other hosts, killing all but one of the guests, an early incarnation of, a, of the killer robot immortalised in the Terminator, Hal Bent, on fighting back. As Rainier Val explains, the monster is no longer simply a creation cranked up in a secret laboratory, but rather a part of the everyday leisure time an expression of the prevalent greed for pleasure and longing for perfection. The Western aesthetic of the film is achieved through the loving attention to detail by its director, drawing upon his own nostalgia, growing up with it on his living room TV. Westworld scratches off the first layer of what becomes technophobia. We may learn to love the advantages that the technological advancements we're making, however, they come at a human cost. Reverting back to a simpler time may be the only way to escape, even on a surface level. The flight into the future in many fantasy films is often a flight into the past, towards a world of more traditional values. Crichton literally uses the images of the past in a seemingly perfect future before it begins to fall apart. Moving forward and over to Australia, we enter George Miller's apocalyptic landscape of Mad Max. Australia, another country with its own version of Manifest Destiny, Terra Nullius, an empty land. Manifest Destiny being a politically driven belief that the expansion of the United States was inevitable and justified. Whilst Terra Nullius, a British colonial term that deemed land that's unoccupied or uninhabited, the first Mad Max does a great job of setting up the world that Max Ratansky exists in, an origin story. Mad Max The Road Warrior allows us time to explore this dystopian future in more detail. George Miller has created a Wild West on his own Australian terms. The apocalyptic portrayal of landscapes in the Mad Max films implies a sterile and alien environment in which the human actors are an island of life and culture. Only the strong can survive in a fight for petrol that has become the new currency. It's as valuable as gold was. Instead of any real depiction of Aboriginals, we have the feral child who literally climbs and crawls about, fighting those they don't like, communicating using a range of growls, no more than a monster dressed in rags, going as far as adopting the Aboriginal boomerang as a weapon, misappropriating Australia's native culture for the film, showing a future where cultural identity is lost in the face of survival. Post-apocalyptic futures are a staple of the sci-fi genre, depicting future worlds that have failed for one reason or another, reverting back to an earlier stage of human development, where lawlessness was rampant relying on your wits alone to stay alive. If these films teach us anything, you need a hero to save the day. If it's a leather-clad Mad Max or a new prison inmate such as Snake Piskin who's given a second chance in a world that he only knows how to survive. Professionalism in the arts of violence is the hero's defining characteristic. These new takes on the Western were shaped by the internal logic of the genre development which fostered a certain kind of stylization of the Western and its hero by the pressures and anxieties of the post-war, Cold War transition. That description only goes so far in describing Snake. He's an anti-hero, respected by the criminals whose reputation precedes him wherever he goes. Nils Meyer goes further, seeing him as a man of action who acts instinctively, speaks only when necessary, and when he shoots he doesn't miss. He manipulates people to achieve his objectives, knows no scruples and doesn't give a damn about ideas. 
Other visual links and cues to the Western include the custom of Lee Van Cleef, who appeared in multiple Westerns. The island of Manhattan has become an enclosed area of untamed society, which has regressed to mirror the Wild West. The editing of the film constantly refers back to High Noon, cutting back and forth from clocks, counting down the remainder of Piskin's life as he attempts to rescue the captured president. When Piskin enters a theatre, the whole sequence is framed like a western, like when a cowboy enters a saloon alone to discover dancers entertaining patrons. Kurt Russell's performance channels the steely-eyed call of Clint Eastwood's archetype, whilst Cleese is channeling John Wayne, who personifies the genre for 40 years. Lastly, Duke's men are heard screeching on the roof of the World Trade Center like Native Americans as they sabotage the glider that could have taken our hero to safety. Another prominent sci-fi western is the final instalment of the Back to the Future trilogy, when Marty McFly travels back in time to 1885, arriving in Monument Valley, known to many as John Ford Country, a director strongly associated with the genre. The desert landscape home to the Navajo Nation has become a commonplace landscape where filmmakers have depicted their vision of the Wild West mythology, this time standing in for an early hill valley. Settlers have started to make it their own. The DeLorean itself drives into the first stereotype, riding into Native Americans accompanied by the sweeping Big Country-esque soundtrack. For Marty, he brings with him nearly a century of modern associations, transforming him into a walking cliché, going as far as wearing pastel pink and blue with tussles. On arriving in the frontier town, things become a little more accurate, if only played for comic effect such as nearly getting killed by a stagecoach or walking into manure. But this doesn't last long when Marty is dragged through the town by Biff's predecessor on horseback, a common form of violence in the 1950s western. The clichés are shown up for how implausible they really are, such as attempting to jump from horses onto a moving train. It's not as easy as the films will have you believe. If Kurt Russell channeled Clint Eastwood for his performance in Escape from New York, Marty goes one step further, trying to become him, adopting the name of Clint Eastwood and the persona. He has the hard task to uphold the reputation of a legend of the genre and avoid affecting the timeline. The residents of Hill Valley have no connection to this figure from our time. Under the guise of Eastwood, McFly is able to blend into this world to the point of reenacting a gunfight from a fistful of dollars, wearing a stove door as a bulletproof vest. McFly is forced to uphold the male code of honour, defending himself against Biff's relative Mad Dog Tenon, who we know to be an idiot, who should be left alone. If he ignores him, it's a sign of cowardice, which is impossible for a man assuming Eastwood's identity. In short, the myth of the West has to be maintained. Whilst Doc Brown has adapted well to this time period, but finds himself falling back on 20th century ideas such as consumer law. When Mad Dog Tannen wants revenge for the poor horseshoeing that resulted in the death of his horse, believing the Doc owed him $75, which the Doc disputes ever receiving. To stop the potential of a gunfight, he offers a refund to resolve the dispute. When he falls in love with Clara, a forward-thinking schoolteacher, showing a passion for science and science fiction of the time. Only when the Doc tries to break up with her, his attempt at honesty is met with disgust, believing he's using H.G. Wells' language to blind her from the truth. She's more intelligent than he has estimated her to be. By the end of the film, she wants only honesty from him, whatever the time period they're both living in. Back to the Future, part three, is a sci-fi comedy playing fondly with the genre as two men out of their own time again figure out how they can get back to their own using what they have to hand. Using ingenuity and flourishes of genius, they are at least able to send Marty back in the DeLorean using explosives to cause a steam engine to move faster than it was designed to at the time, giving the iconic car the momentum to get back to their presence. H.G. Wells may be mentioned in passing in Back to the Future Part 3, its visual stamp is all over Wild Wild West, a misstep Will Smith and cast who obviously had more fun making this flat comedy western than his audience does.
having steampunk technology in an era that it feels very much at home. With a conceivable premise for a film, a faction of the losing Confederate army having risen and made use of this technology in the hopes of causing another civil war in the States. This technology is derived from steam and steel, making for more conceivable and outlandish contraptions that fill the screen. The more understated pieces as invented by Kevin Klein's Artemis Gordon are more zany than the bombastic and out of control pieces that are at the command of Kenneth Branagh's Dr. Arliss Loveless that lose all sense of logic. Smith's character is seemingly outmoded carrying a six-gun revolver whilst his white partner and an inventor, Artemis Gordon, relies on his technology to save the day. Their effectiveness is poor in the face of the classic more reliable revolver that does more than just fine. Technology is supposed to be the driving force in this film, allowing the possibility of progression, antagonism and hopefully some humour. The technology in the 19th century should make sense if progress took a different course to reveal a possible future. However, being set in the Wild West, it's usually technology with, from a distant future that sparks that sense of wonder, becoming here a threat to those natives of the period. Moving on to a more successful piece of sci-fi that shares its roots on its sleeve, Joss Whedon, who's a long-time student of the Western genre, understands how to structure the genre in the guise of sci-fi. After his failed but much-loved series Firefly was cancelled, he got another chance with Serenity, a film that at first glance looks like an extended episode of the cancelled space opera. If you look and listen closer, it's a western in form. Following the spaceship Serenity that exists in a future where Earth has long since been abandoned for a group of planets in one region of space, this carefully structured future is very believable. The descendants of Earth have since had another civil war, leaving those who lost to wander forever, whilst the winners live in a controlled utopia known as the Alliance. The crew of the Serenity are a ragtag bunch, willing to take risks and explore regions of space that the Alliance would rather stay away from, encountering species known as the Reavers, who easily stand in for Native Americans. The crew's dialogue is heavily inflected with an older version of American English. The script is littered with language that wouldn't look out of place in the Wild West. These are renegades from a culture who refuse to conform even linguistically. The dialogue has an old world poetry that is not found in the Alliance characters who are given more direct, clean lines. The idea of utopias as a vision of a perfect future are only desirable in principle. For Joss Whedon, he feels that utopias are generally boring in science fiction. They don't allow for conflict and drama in terms that science fiction needs to both to thrive. Originally, the idea of Thomas More's utopia as a humanist society was written in response to his Renaissance contemporaries. Unfortunately, he hadn't anticipated the events of the future that would destroy this sense of optimism in the face of the Russian Revolution. Helen Lewis notes that suddenly the blank conformity of utopias seemed oppressive rather than merely troubling. Being ordered to be happy makes unhappiness an act of political resistance. Our civilization seems fragile now, precarious. The end of history turned out not to be the triumph of Western liberal democracy, but more of the same old grievances and secular conflicts. In our attempts to reach a form of utopian society, freedoms are oppressed in the process to reach that perfect world. Finally, turning to the inspiration for Cowboys Invaded, Cowboys and Aliens, a fun romp that places an older civilization at the mercy of a far more advanced one. Taking the idea of manifest destiny is turned on its head when a more advanced alien force believes they have the right to invade mid-19th century Earth. This alien culture outmodes the cowboys. The aliens in both the film and my animation throw this power structure on its head. In the film, Daniel Craig and Harrison Ford have put their old rivalries aside as they team up even more reluctantly with local Apaches. No longer is this cowboys versus natives, it's humans versus aliens. A fight for humanity's very existence is at stake. 
Cowboys and Aliens shows us that if nothing else, we have travelled a long and winding trail since the days of the Biograph Otis and the heroic Cheyenne Harry in Blaze Tracy. On the other hand, and despite its high-tech gloss, Favreau's film loosely recalls some of the earliest silent westerns, perhaps most especially 1903's The Great Train Robbery. That is to say, before creators of western movies became increasingly interested in more intricate ways of developing character and narrative, their primary goal was to simply astonish audiences with pure action and spectacle. This film is having fun as it combines both genres that are, by this point, fully informed in terms of language, iconography and even cliché. With lots of spectacle to wow the audience, everyone in the film is having fun and so is the audience. On the surface, the western genre is filled with its own unique clichés. Wide open landscapes and gunplay, you can forget how much of that translates to a dystopian future such as Escape from New York or the lawlessness of a disaster ridden Australia in Mad Max. Technology can seem either out of place or right at home if handled the right way. When combined with science fiction, the possibilities are endless as the vastness of space that the serenity is brave enough to explore.